Good morning, everybody. Can you hear? I can't see you at the back, so I'm not sure how we work this one out. But can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? All right, excellent. Well, well done for coming. And uh, I hear some of you brave some fairly bad weather. So a double thank you for coming along, particularly for hearing this talk today. Um, I've got an hour, and the last time I spoke at an AV event, I overran my time, so I've been told pretty severely I've got to stick to time at the moment. So I've got an impossible job because I'd like to talk to you about what's happening to the children in this country, but I can't talk to you about what's happening because everything is done under secret courts. And the UK column newspaper already has four injunctions out to stop us telling you what's being done with the children. It's a good system, isn't it? You're doing something wrong, so you run a secret court, and then you hide it. And I'll tell you a bit more about it. If this little pointer works, and we're not sure, doesn't seem to like it too much. Um, basically, in the picture, we've got our families looking a bit dejected, but behind them, things are going on very high level, and that's Port Cullis House in Westminster, which is the new seat of power for our MPs. If you ever go in there, you'll find it quite interesting because you're surrounded by armed guards. Okay, this is the UK column, and the one on the, the left-hand front page is a new edition, which has been put together by Mike Robinson, who has recently joined us. He's been doing the website for a while, but to take some pressure off me, produced this edition, which has gone down extremely well. And I've decided to put... Um, um, Mandelson there because we had some tremendous information from uh, Vladimir Bukowski's researcher, uh, Paolo, who exposes that we have Marxists in government. And that comes from Russian sources, it's not from just pure English sources. The moment our newspaper came on the streets, people began to talk to us about things going on. And one of the early ones that came up was stories about children. I didn't believe them initially because they sounded too far-fetched until the first mother arrived in our offices carrying about four ring, file, ring binders of documents, court documents, transcripts. And the story that unfolded, which I will touch on, was just incredible. And the crime which I've listed there this is absolutely correct. False evidence, false documentation, perjury in court, bullying and threats by the judiciary, the police, the social services. Everything you can think of in order to put pressure on the parents can be the father, but very often they tend to go for the mother. Now, if anybody is sitting thinking, I am a social services person or I am a policeman, etc., it's shades of grey. I am not standing here saying that everybody who works from social services is bad, and I'm not saying that for the police or the courts. However, the body of evidence says that within these public sectors, we now have criminal and corrupt activity on a very big scale, and it needs to be exposed and pretty quickly. What are they doing? Well, basically, they're breaking up families. They're breaking up mums and dads. They're getting the children away from the parents. And when those children are away, they can be used for things. They can be used for drug testing. If they die as a result of an illness or circumstances in hospitals, then body parts are disappearing. And otherwise, they can go into a more or less a gulag system where they can be abused. And some of that came out on the BBC a while ago when a very brave lady spoke out about her abuse in a children's home where she was tied down and systematically raped. Although she's got the evidence and other girls and boys who were abused have got the evidence, they cannot get justice because when they go to the police or they go to social services or they go to the courts, their pathway to justice is blocked and I mean blocked, totally and utterly. And in the last resort, threats will be used to get them to back down. Now, these are some of the statistics. 
I'm going to be thanking a man called Ian Joseph a bit later on, who's done a huge amount of work in a book, which I'll show you the cover of. Um, so some statistics have come from him and some I've researched, but this is factual, 25,000 children a year are now disappearing into the system. And we ask why, and we ask what's happening, and we ask who are these people who are now more qualified to say how you should look after your children than you are. My two children are adult, so I've moved on a bit. But any of you who've got younger children or you've got grandchildren, I can tell you those children are not safe. It doesn't matter what school they go to, social services in that area have the power to take those children if they so wish. Now these are some of the headlines that we've had in the paper. I've only picked a few because there's so many. Social services being described as the Stasi, that's come up several times. The father who was asked to donate organs to his son, but he wasn't allowed to see his son at all. Even judges, and there are good judges out there, but they're pretty lacking in backbone, are talking about foul play. And then the two cases down at the bottom, we're starting to get into something very sinister, because people are now saying, you're really not bright enough to have children of your own. Who says? Who makes this decision? Because that was the start of the eugenics program, selective breeding. And for those of you that think eugenics came out of the Nazi party, it didn't. It came out of the Tavistock Institute in London. It's a British problem, and it was exported to the Nazis. Now the key thing, if we say who benefits, which is a great way to start a trial, it's pretty easy because everybody who touches a child who's taken away by social services is raking in the money. Legal profession tops. The industry of taking children into care, we know at the moment, is about 20 billion pounds worth. Billion. 70,000 pounds a day if a legal team really gets stuck into it. 3,000 a day. Medical experts, therapists, and then we've got the homes. 7,000 pounds a week. Now a lot of morality disappears out the window pretty quickly when money appears. And in my opinion, linking huge payments of money with children is itself the start of a recipe for disaster. And yet, at the moment, we, the general public, are not told the detail. You don't read it in the newspapers, and the reason is that the newspapers are gagged, just like the UK column is. If you take it a step further, there have been targets in place where the government says to a local authority, we'll give you even more money if you can get more children put into care. So this is just a summary of the amounts paid to various councils for meeting their government set targets for adoption. And it's big money. If you're a county council or a city council and your budget is under pressure, to be able to take in half a million pounds a year by putting children into the system is pretty easy picking. So we have now put a price on our children's heads. And if you think, and I'll keep stressing this, if you think because of your social position or your knowledge or your intelligence or because you're a good person that these people are not capable of taking your child away, you are absolutely wrong. I'm sorry it's uh, such a subject for nine o'clock in the morning, but we need to deal with it because if we don't, we've lost control of our society. Now this is one of the key things with social services. They are a law unto themselves. So wherever they're situated, they've got their own links through local authorities and into government and through the police and through into the secret courts. And those courts are secret. The public is not allowed in. The press are not allowed in. And even though Mr. Straw was recently boasting that there would be more openness, he was actually cheating you because what he was saying is there would be more openness on the decisions, not on how the, the court proceedings actually made those decisions. I think he lied. 
try and think of it this way. We've got social services who've got tremendous power. They can take a human being away from its parents and they can then hold that child totally away from family until the child is 18, by which case, in many, many cases, the child has been turned against their own parents, its own parents. Now, how can, they, how can social services get away with this? Well, it's to do with the fact that they aren't accountable to any normal regime. So, in the diagram there, we've got the fact that social services, even within the local authority, are not accountable to normal, normal democratically elected councillors. In Neathport Talbot, which I'll mention later, I can tell you that councillors have tried to ask questions about a disgraceful incident with a young girl and they've been told you're not entitled to know because of child and family confidentiality. So the people we elect as councillors to keep track on what's happening cannot penetrate their own social services. And if they do, very often the legal officer in the council will put them under pressure and a common bullying tactic is that they then use the, um, the scrutiny committees and public uh, standards in public office to put pressure on the councillors. How do I know this? Because of the cases that I've assisted with, but also due to the councillors talking to me. They hide directly behind the secrecy of the family courts. And those courts themselves can then be used to gag people. So you get too close to the truth, whoomph, in comes the injunction. What does an injunction look like? Well, I've got four sitting on my desk, but I can't show you because the injunction says that I'm not even allowed to show you the injunction, which puts me under a gagging order. But in the box with the red language is allegedly part of an injunction. I couldn't confirm that, of course. But you get the idea. So a fairly nominal judge, a district judge, can come out with a gagging order which is UK-wide on every means there is of getting information out. TV, press, radio, pamphlets, and they mean what they say because people have been put in prison for trying to tell the story. So we've got a secret regime set up in the middle of our councils. It can take children. It does take children. And then when you try and expose it, when the mothers try and expose it, you're in big trouble. Now what I want to do is get you thinking broader because when you read the articles in the paper, you say, well, they must have done something wrong. There must have been something wrong with the mother or the father or, yeah, there's got to be something there. Well, I'm going to start to suggest to you, although in some cases there is something there, in other cases we are seeing this as part of something much bigger and much nastier. Now, I don't know whether you know about this, but children are to be databased. And there's three basic databases. There's the contact point. There's a social services database and there's going to be a special one for special elitist people because we are heading for a dictatorship where there will be an elite and then there will be other people. So there's a special database for the children of MPs and celebrities so that uh, we don't get too close to their children. Fingerprinting in schools. How many know it's going on in your area? Can you put a hand up if you know? Well, you need to start digging because it's happening in all areas. Sometimes it's done as a game. Sometimes it's done through the mouse in the libraries. But three more schools in Plymouth this week are adopting fingerprints even for going into lessons. Mm. Now, even Nick Clegg, who's not a friend of mine because he doesn't tell the truth about the European Union, even he saw it was dangerous, and this was a statement he made in 2007 saying it was sinister. That's his word, sinister. Have you heard him speak out on it since then? No. 
because the Lib Lab Con means that all three major parties are helping to insert this type of thing into society. The SS, social services, very, very secretive. And we've discovered this little thing going on here with a program produced by Siemens which is going to look at risk with IT systems and data. They do it for NATO, they do it for the British government. I'm told by a source that includes MI5, that's interesting. But they're also now going to do it for your children. And in case you don't know, if you travel on the trains a lot, when you go to a station and you are now CCTV'd from the moment you go in, and on some cases, in some companies, you're actually CCTV'd while you're sitting on the train, a lot of that is run by Siemens. So we now have a German company, I'm sure it's a wonderful, kind, benevolent company, now beginning to monitor not only the British public on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're now working with social services and they're getting close to our children. Even Germans themselves will tell you they are getting very nervous about seeing things which they'd seen in the past start to re-emerge. Well, let's have a look at people. So who's pulling the strings? I've only got an hour, so I can't go through them all, but I'm going to give you an idea. And this lady, Harriet Harman, is very interesting. Do you all know Harriet? Yes? Um, she was fined, I think, a while ago for speeding. Um, well, she said that last year, something like 200 people went to prison through secret courts. That's a very interesting statement, isn't it? Something like. That little bit tells you she's not really interested in how many. But I'm pretty interested in how many people are sent to prison after going through a secret court, because if it's one, the next person could be me, or it could be you. This is very dangerous stuff, because the public has no track as to what's happening with people. And if you look at dictatorships, this is the route for putting people in gulags. We're not used to this sort of stuff in Britain because we've had a democracy which has worked pretty well for so long. But if you talk to people in Russia or Poland or Germany, they know it can happen. And what I'm going to say to you this morning, and I don't get any pleasure because I'd rather tell you a joke or something, is it's happening here. But it's creeping. It's piece by piece by piece. So, if we look at this lady a bit more, and this was a photograph which I liked because it's of her when she was younger. When she was younger, she was involved in the Council for Civil Liberties, top right-hand corner of the box. And she was the legal officer. Now, that organization is now Liberty, and run by a lady called Chakrabarti. Do you all know it? It's all about liberties. However, at one stage, the government was proposing that the age of consent should be reduced. And the National Council for Civil Liberties got involved. And Harriet Harman was the person who signed some of their responses. And she suggested that the new law could lead to damaging and absurd prosecutions. It could increase censorship. She, she suggested that a pornographic photo or film of a child should not be considered indecent unless it could be shown that the subject had suffered. Did you get a warm feeling, uh, this lady? Now, the other thing is, at the time, that the National Council for Civil Liberties was associated with two paedophile, pro-paedophile organizations, Pi and Pal. So we've got an organization associated with pro-paedophile people, and its spokesperson at the time was Harriet Harman. And this is the lady who says, well, maybe 200 people have gone through a secret court into prison. Why? Because they were trying to expose paedophilia. Something is wrong. If you look at liberty a bit more, 
Now down in the bottom right hand box, I've obviously run out of battery power here, in the bottom right hand box are some of the people who have been connected with this organisation Liberty and they're big names, Clement Attlee, and Nurin Bevan, these are the people we're supposed to be looking up to. So if they were involved in this organisation, maybe they were duped as to what it was probably doing. Bertram Russell, some of you might know a little bit about him, because when we go down this sort of route, we start getting close to people interested in theosophical type stuff, the occult. Some of them were interested in Satanism. And Aldous Huxley, you might know the name of. If you don't, I suggest you do a bit of research because his wife pops up and she's got involved with a charity, Children, Our Ultimate Investment. And it operates a teens and toddlers initiative. And there's a project, Caressing, which is encouraging young children to mix and touch adults. It's all there when you know where to look for this information. And the more you dig, the more you get an uneasy sense that something is being constructed which is very sinister indeed. I think Mr. Clegg underestimated a few things. Just remember that children bit. Now here we've got Ed Balls. What a lovely man. And Mr. Balls takes himself off to Bilderberger meetings. Now, if you don't know about Bilderbergers, you should do, because the Bilderbergers were founded by the pro-Nazi movement immediately after the war. And they meet in secret. You can find this on the internet, and there's one or two really good sites. They meet in secret, and they discuss plans for world government. They just don't bother to talk to us about it, because we're the goyim, we're the cattle. But Mr. Balls goes off with a meeting. He, he then says, well, he attended in his private capacity, and he then charges it to the public purse. So he's either confused or he lies. Don't know which. Now, this is a press release from the Bilderbergers themselves. I just wanted to put it up to make sure that you knew that I was telling you the truth, because they say in that document that people attend in their private, not official capacity. So even the um, Sunday Telegraph could get pretty upset when they realised that he'd been claiming expenses on the public purse. And they got interested in the Bilderbergers talking about them being, themselves being, a shadow world government. How many of you know that at the moment there's a committee running inside Westminster which is full of pro-world government MPs? Do you know about that? It's there. You can find it if you go looking for it. I'll help with some of the information which will go up on the website in due course. But the information's there if you ask. So while you're going about your day-to-day -day business, worrying about how to pay the mortgage and where the money's coming from, we've got MPs who think that they are so clever, they're going to rearrange the whole world. Well, some of them are clever. But unfortunately, some of them are very dangerous people because they actually believe in themselves. So if we do a summary, come on machine. Here's the Bilderbergers. First cha chairman was Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. Annual meetings, and we know at these meetings, people are selected for particular positions. And there's no minutes, and they have very tight security. And we have people associated with education and children getting involved. So when in a minute I start talking about the fact they're teaching eugenics in schools, we've got something very interesting, because the Nazis got involved with that. So are they doing it again? I'll let you decide. What about academy schools? Do you know about those? They've been there in the paper. We're now bringing big business in to run schools because that's the way to do it because the public purse is, is broke. Well, we can print money to go to the banks, but we can't print money to run schools or run hospitals. Very strange, isn't it? It's fraud on a massive scale. But academy schools are being set up. There's about six in the country. And these are some of the characteristics 
we know they're going to take children in at an early age. They're going to keep them to 18. The design of the buildings are interesting. Previously, our schools had big, bright, light rooms because that was uplifting and that was good for health and your mental health. These go the other way, a lot of enclosed spaces. Now, if you want to play around with people's minds, you do it in a room with no windows. <laughs> but you can trust me, because I've got a suit on. <laughs> Therapy sessions. They are going to have therapy. They do have therapy rooms. And when you say who's going to get therapy, all the children are going to get therapy. Are you allowed in as a parent? Well, only if the therapist gives you permission. Otherwise, they have client confidentiality to the child. I was told, I'll call it a story, but I believe it is true, that a mother went to a school fairly close to me to pick up her teenage, young teenage daughter, to be told, I'm sorry, she won't be going home because we are going to section her. And the mother stood there, just stunned, to be told that her daughter had been seeing the school psychiatrist for nearly a year. But she, as the mother, had not been told. I don't know the outcome of that story yet, but I don't think it's going to be good. Who's running the schools? Industrial, military, private companies. Big ones. Vosper Thornycroft, British Aerospace is going to get involved. American companies. Why are these suddenly clustered around? Who's driving them? They're going to use a lot of Wi-Fi stuff. So the environment in that school is going to be heavily microwaved. In fact, children are going to be encouraged to carry around electric um, laptops so that they can have lessons on the move. This is all happening under your noses. And Brown and Cameron and Clegg know it's going on. I've put a lady at the bottom, Kaz, an Aussie lady. If you go and look for Kaz, Academy Schools, an absolute return for kids, ARC, on YouTube. She's done some fantastic little video clips which will give you more information than I can possibly give you now. So we did, on the right-hand side, an article about the academy schools in the UK column, and we will put these up on the UK column website for you so you can read what we originally wrote. And what I'm doing is bringing all this information back out into the open so that you can see the picture I'm seeing. But these are the characteristics of the school. The curriculum can be changed after a year. We know that for a fact because we've cited one of the contracts. So initially the government sets the curriculum, but after a year the curriculum for that school is being set by a company that specialises in industrial military matters. Nice. Execution Limited is funding absolute return for kids. Like the name? Dream Mill. Do you like that name? Because that's looking into behavioural change in children. And they know there's going to be behavioural change because they are going to do the things to the kids to create that change. Have you ever wondered about the 29 suicides in South Wales? Do you know about those? in a very small geographic area. What the good old BBC and the media isn't telling you is these suicide clusters are appearing in other places, particularly, particularly Northern Ireland. And the thing is that in committing suicide, the youngsters are doing things which are not normal. So, for instance, girls don't normally hang themselves. They prefer drugs or slashing their wrists. But now you're seeing people committing suicides in ways which are not the normal ways. And what it is heading towards is that these youngsters and young people are very disturbed and something's disturbing them. And it's not microwave towers. It's something that's being done to them in school, in colleges and elsewhere. I've got the project caressing down there. I've got the teaching of eugenics. 
And that is absolutely correct. They are starting to teach eugenics or selective breeding in schools. And I've also at the bottom there, if you can read it, put a little bit about who's funding this. Goldman Sachs, EIM, International Asset Management, Warburgs, Citicorp, Deutsche Morgan Grenfell. These are all vast international banks who suddenly want to get very close to our children. Why? Now we've got something else going on and that is that there is a massive third sector. If some of you have heard talks that I've done on Common Purpose, you'll have heard me talking about the third sector. The third sector is all the quangos, charities. Do we have charities anymore? You see people going around with a little bucket collecting for something, an SPCC, whatever it is. But actually, charities are an industry. And in this country, they're worth £44 billion. Pounds. And this government and advisors to this government and the Conservative government... Did you see what I did with my hand there? It's creepy, isn't it? That was an accident. Basically, the third sector is being used as the new controlling sector of society. As you take power away from Parliament, that's why they're talking about getting rid of MPs. As you take power away from Parliament, it's going to go to the third sector where chosen leaders, think common purpose, are going to run things. And that's why Mr. Cameron is smugly saying, I'm going to help poor people. I'm going to take the weight of government off them. What that means is, I'm going to remove MPs from Parliament. I'm going to help people by putting more money into charities and the third sector. He's not going to help them at all. That money will be used to impose the control structure for the new government. And your children are to be re-educated and re-engineered into a new society. Now, Bernardo's is a classic here because the chief executive stood up recently and said, Brilliant, we must adopt more children at birth. Some children are being adopted before they're born. They're nominated for adoption before they're born. The children are taken, the baby's taken away from the mother. Immediately she's given birth. That's happened on numerous occasions. And this man, chief executive of charity, says we need more babies taken at birth. What he doesn't say is he effectively provides consultancy. So the more babies that come into the world that he can get his hands on, the more money Bernardo's makes. So the next time the little pot comes around with Bernardo's, just think a bit deeper about what that organisation's doing. And the bottom statement is John Hemmings, who got a bit hot under the collar and said, this man doesn't really know what he's talking about. But I tell you, he does know what he's talking about because he's into the money for children business or children for money. And this is all going on under our noses. The BBC's involved. And they've done at least one major program where they're after parents. And I challenged them and they got pretty heavy in a meeting in Plymouth. And when I asked do you know the children are willingly given up for adoption? They were advertised. I'll come over here. This is a magazine where they're showing photos of children and advertising them. Just like puppies. But the BBC got a bit stroppy. So we started digging. Now, Common Purpose is there. I'm not going to go too heavy on Common Purpose because it's a whole subject. But this is the doorway to their London headquarters. It doesn't say anything. And that's because they're doing a lot behind the scenes, particularly behavioural modification. And they are going into schools in a very big way. And they're going into social services. Can I prove what I'm saying? Everything. So that's a little snapshot of Wales for you. Interesting, isn't it? Common purpose is amongst the social services, and we've got problems with people. 
And this one is my favourite because about three years ago I started to warn about paedophiles involved with Common Purpose because Common Purpose runs secret networks. And here we've got James Rennie, recently sentenced. He was abusing children as young as three months in Scotland. He was a Common Purpose trained person. He was selected for that training by a Common Purpose advisory board. On that board was a senior police officer who later formed the same police force that arrested him for paedophilia. 30th of October, Common Purpose was still proudly boasting his Facebook on one of their internal websites. And this organization goes into school to train your children. We are using neuro-linguistics on the police and the police are involved with children. Let's talk some cases. This is a lady up in Liverpool. She had three children. She was in the park one day. And a small motorbike came up onto the grass and hit one of her boys, broke his arm, damaged his leg, and he was duly taken to hospital, where, as a responsible mum, she stayed by his bedside for three days, while the other two children went to her mother. At the end of the third day, uh, she'd been away, gone to the loo or something, came back, and there's a big group of people around the bed, about eight of them, doctors and people in plain clothes. And they said to her, uh, Mrs. Spalak, we're, we're going to take your, your son. We're going to take your children. She said, what are you talking about? Well, we've got reason to say that these children need to be taken into care. That was all that was said to her. And then and there, they took the boy in bed, and while that was happening, the police went to her mother's house because her mother was looking after the other two children and they took the other two children. And she has never had access to those children since. Never. We've printed her story which caused ructions and a judge was moved because every piece of information used against this woman is fabricated, a pack of lies from start to finish. Sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? There must be something wrong with her. There isn't. She doesn't drink, she doesn't take drugs, she doesn't have multiple partners. She is a normal lady, separated from her previous husband. They've taken the three children. And every shred of evidence used against her is fraudulent. This is another case. I've been intimately involved with this one. I've given a talk on it before I got an injunction slapped on me. This lady had a daughter. The daughter was ill. And I'll tell you what was the matter with her, as they later found out. She had a thing called Zollinger's disease, which is multiple perforations of the gut, like multiple ulcers. Intensely painful, so painful that the pain eventually radiates right, right through to your back. She went into a series of South Wales hospitals where she wasn't treated. We've got the documents where we show that there was no diagnosis, but they prescribed a huge cocktail of drugs. They tried to get the mother at one stage to give her a dose of oral morphine. If the mother had given it to her, she would have killed the daughter. She was run around hospitals, the daughter was in pain, she couldn't work at school properly, social services got involved, nightmare. Because the next minute is that in taking the girl to America to get a medical opinion, social services went to America with no legal, lawful documentation and took the girl away at gunpoint because they got the American police involved. And I have sat in a court with this lady uh, twice or three times now, and in the last case, because she now acts for herself, she proved in that court that when the girl was taken away, the local authority had no legal power to do so whatsoever. The judge was happy to allow the local authority to have witnesses, but he wouldn't allow the mother to have witnesses, even though they were local councillors prepared to testify on oath that their council had broken the law. 
Welcome to Secret Courts. This is a small selection of the drugs this poor girl was uh, prescribed, and that is a statement by a judge, allegedly, trying to clear his yard arm, as they say in the Navy, by saying that when they went to America, there wasn't really any breach of order, i.e. it wasn't his fault. Nevertheless, that girl has never been returned to her mother, and she's now over 18, and she has been turned. If your mother doesn't love you, why would she leave you in this home? This is a little note this girl wrote. She wrote a series of them. And I tell you, I still find it difficult. Just read what she says. She was never allowed in a court to say she wanted to go home. When they brought her back from America, they put this girl in a psychiatric institute. They told her, you are imagining your pain. What about that for mental cruelty? And eventually, though, social services ended up putting her on a cocktail of drugs till they realized that what the mother had discovered in America, Zollinger's, was true. There wasn't any apology, and the girl was never given back. And she wrote about 20 pleading letters like this. And she tells about social services people laughing at her. A Plymouth couple, I've got an injunction, can't talk about them. Their baby was ill, Derriford Hospital. The hospital said it was a cancer, a form of cancer. They wanted to do chemo, all sorts of things. The parents just didn't believe it. And they said, no, we don't want the treatment. Bang, in came social services. Baby taken away, subsequently proved the hospital diagnosis was wrong and the parents were right. Never had the baby back and the mother has subsequently had two further babies and they are taken away as well. On the last occasion, social services went into the delivery room to tell the mother, having she'd just given birth, that that baby was also going to be taken away. And one of the two social workers that went into the delivery room had um, shingles. Because they're Christians, there are in the notes intimations that they're mentally ill. If you're a Christian, you've got to be mentally ill. This is a fantastic lady. I speak to her a lot, a 10-year-old son taken. If I had more time, I could show you more. Within a few weeks of disappearing into a care home, he's thin, weak, and he's so frightened he's wetting himself. But she said, the scary thing is, Brian, they're hunting me for my three-year-old. Hunting. And this is the word that the parents use. And what fascinated me is people who gave me information, different parts of the country, it was a template operating. They'd never colluded or talked to each other, but their stories as to how the social services took their children tied in. This is a French lady, married originally to an Englishman living in this country. She discovers that her two girls are being abused. She goes to social services and the police for help. The case is twisted 180 degrees, because this is the technique. And eventually, it destroys her health. So they've now got her pinned as a sort of psychiatric case. Tough lady, Corinne. She fought and fought. And eventually, much to her amazement, was awarded custody of the girls and permission to go to France. She took them to France, and within a few months, the father had fought through the French courts and they re-awarded him custody, even though he was the man abusing the children. I've got some photographs which I'd love to show you, but I don't think you want to see them. Collusion between judges, England, France. Collusion between French social services and English social services. Interesting. And this is a little girl... This is 30 years ago, but this case is very, very important. Her name's Helena Bai, 
And basically, she had an adverse reaction to a, uh, I can't remember the name of the procedure, but you put a dye basically in to see what's going on, and she had a, had a reaction to that. And then the hospital in Bridge End made a diagnosis that really she had epilepsy, and they put her on epilim. And they put her on a dose that made that girl ill, terribly ill, sick, unwell, in pain, headaches. And when the parents said we knew something was wrong and they tried to get her off that medication, they were told if you try and get the, off the medication, we will take your daughter from you. So in the end, they made a decision and they went with the hospital treatment and eventually the girl died under quite horrible circumstances. The hospital lied over the time at which the girl died. They didn't tell the parents for some time. And the reason they did that is because whilst they were delaying telling the parents the girl was actually dead and preventing them from seeing her, they were stripping body parts out of her. All provable. And they still haven't got her back. They've got bits of her back, but they haven't got all of her back. This is not an isolated case, but I haven't got time to tell you more. This one's slightly different, but it shows the establishment working. This is a lady called Anne Gregg and her daughter Holly. And when Holly was six years old, she started to be abused by her father and a ring of people including carers, nurses, somebody involved with the police, somebody involved with the Scottish judiciary. And although Holly is down, is down syndrome, she has a fantastic memory. She knows what was done with her. She knows where it was done. She knows who did it. She knows their names. She knows the relationships between people. She remembers it all. And there has never been a proper police investigation. This is typical. And despite the fact there's been no police investigation, this lady has been awarded £8,500 by a criminal injuries board. How can you award criminal injuries unless there's been a crime? Well, if you want to cover up dirty dealings, including paedophilia, by people in the police and the judiciary, this is how you do it. And the good old BBC dropped this like a hot potato. Because Anne, in fighting for justice for her daughter, found herself surrounded by eight people in her flat one afternoon. They forced her to the ground, they stuck a needle in her backside, and she woke up in a psychiatric unit. And they gave her a few days in a psychiatric unit to warn her off trying to get justice for her daughter. That is the article in the latest UK column, and we've brought some of those papers here, so you can read the story for yourself. It is disgusting. They went for help all over the place, and a month ago they went and, well, they wrote to Mr... Alex Salmon, because all this took place in Aberdeen area, Grampian Police. And it took, a le it took one month for his office to come back to say that it was receiving attention. A girl was raped between the ages of 6 and 14, vulnerable, Down syndrome, raped and abused by members of the people who should be protecting us. And yet it takes them a month to look at it. This is my view. Can you recognize it? It's a wet fish. It's a salmon. This man is big trouble because he is prepared to cover up. He must be covering it up because he's not investigating it. And although this incident has happened north of the border, I can tell you that although they are now living in England, English police are still not assisting matters to get justice for this girl who was a, a raped repeatedly, gang raped. How can this happen in this country? Well, it happens because Jack Straw and others have created a secret court system 
where you cannot get justice. Right, I've got about seven minutes. Call it ten, happy with that. Have I got a mic still? What's happened? No. Oh, okay. Right, this guy, a uh, wonderful man, lives down in Monaco, written this book, 434 pages, a lot of detail in there, and I've used some of his material, and I'm delighted to give him a big push there. These are key things to do with attributes of people involved in child snatching. They're very cold. People within social services or the police or the judiciary, they lack emotion. Very, very cold. Yeah? They lie. They falsify documents. They bully. They intimidate. They threaten. They spread false rumors to help get the children away. They turn children against the parents. I've just told you the one, mummy doesn't love you because mummy's just had another baby, so she obviously doesn't like you. These people are somehow being taught how to use psychological bullying. And in some cases, the mothers have told us, and they usually say, I'm not sure I should tell you this because you'll think I'm a bit loopy, but it was scary when they came because they were like little robots. Now, I will tell you what this is. It's the result of programming. These people are being given neuro-linguistics, which are changing their values, and the Nazis did this. Now, I'm going to go very quickly because I want to build the picture and I've only got five minutes. This is Ian Joseph's guide to survival. And this man knows what he's talking about. He's legally trained and he's helped and is still helping a large number of mothers and, uh, and parents. Never contact social services. You couldn't get a better statement than that. Yeah, don't sign anything. Don't give your children up even if it's supposed to be temporary. Refuse to be assessed by psychiatrists. Why? Because they lie about you. And don't let them access to your medical records. And don't write any letters. So everything he is saying is stay away from these people, they're dangerous. But aren't social services supposed to be the people who look after our children? Now I'm going to do the impossible. I've got four minutes to tell you what's really going on because I want to get your minds this wide instead of just thinking about incidents with children. This lady worked for the European Union in Romania. She discovered what we were told about the children was not entirely true. We were given a picture of disaster where many of the uh, orphanages were trying to help the children with limited means. What she discovered, though, was consultancies and charities were helping traffic Romanian children. She discovered on some of the orphanages there was a bolt-on pharmaceutical laboratory where they were testing the children and including, in some cases, wiring up the children with electrodes when they were introduced to prospective parents. She's exposed it. She lost her job in the EU. She receives death threats. She is now tracking the paedophile networks at the highest levels of the European Union, and that includes Britain. If you go to the Communist Manifesto, look at what it says in number two. Abolish the family. The Frankfurt School psychiatrists actually studied the destruction of society by moral family and spiritual breakdown. Nice people. When the war came, they moved abroad, America, Britain, all over the place. But that is their mentality, vicious. Here's the Communist International. It's going to produce a regional union. It's going to level the economies. That's what's happening to us now. We're being suppressed. And the regions are going to form a new world order. I haven't made that up. That is straight out of their communist Comintern program for 19... 28. People train in this stuff for warfare. This was Stalin's advisor talking about psychopolitics causing chaos, distrust, economic depression. This is at the cover of the 
original Nazi document talking about the formation of a European Union. Just remember the Bilderbergers that I've talked about. If you read that document, it says a lot of things, including single transport system. You've heard it. This is the blueprint for the EU. This is one of our own army psychiatrists, and the, the document is 1940, and in it he's talking about how psychiatrists will penetrate society to re-engineer us into thinking and acting the right way. And he says, we've made a useful attack. This man, intimately linked with the Tavistock Institute, which is itself linked with the formation of the NHS, there's a dirty little trail here, and he was eventually involved with the World Mental Health Federation. By mental health, they mean you're healthy when you're in the new society. This is a document talking about a plan to destroy Western society. It came from a Soviet dissident, and surprise, surprise, it says they're going to destroy families. It's happening. You're watching it. The Fabians are creeping socialism. Here's Tony, because he was chairman, and you can trust him. <laughs> These people are all Marxists, Leninists, or Trotskyists. You can check it for yourselves. New Labour is Marxist, and even some of the national newspapers are starting to pick it up. Miliband and Mandelson, unbelievably dangerous. And if you're worried about the Tories, I think you're looking at something which is what? Fascism? Question mark there. Oswald Mosley, what was he? <laughs> well, okay. Also, also leader of the, the British fascist movement. But he gets great praise from Michael Foote, Labour leader, left-wing liberal. So these people are all intertwined. This book puts it together. I'm sorry it's such a poor picture. But a guy called Christopher Storey wrote a very detailed political analysis which said simply the Berlin Wall came down, communism didn't, and that is absolutely true, and I can tell you that as an ex-military person. What it's done is changed form. Hitler's Germany was built on Marxism, the Soviet Union was Marxist-based. And what you are seeing is the full system arriving. Children are to be re-engineered into the new society. You are not going to be allowed to keep your children. And that is the big picture. And they are testing the water at the moment by taking a few thousand children away from people under a false pretext. If you think I'm joking, or I'm Walter Mitty, everything I've said is provable, you can research it yourself. But I tell you, if we could get over the gagging orders, I could present you with this high of information showing that courts are lying in order to help take children away. I'm at the end. Thank you very much.